In the previous segment, we started talking about time series data from dynamical systems. That is, scalar data. You've stuck a single sensor in your system, and you've made a series of observations, evenly sampled in time, of some single variable. As you'll recall, the act of doing that single measurement projects the state space down onto a single axis. If we want to study those dynamics, the full version of them, we have to undo that projection. In other words, we need to reinflate that squashed flat data back into its original form. One way you might think about doing this is by computing derivatives from the data. This goes back to that business of pulling an nth order ODE apart into n first order ODEs, and for those of you who have taken a second course in classical mechanics, this ties back to the notion of a generalized coordinate and its conjugate momentum. In the simple harmonic oscillator and the pendulum, for instance, the state variables are the positions and the velocities. So if we've measured the position, why not just use that data to compute the derivative? You can think about doing this, for instance, with difference methods. If I'm in my car, and I'm at kilometer 56 at exactly 1 o'clock, and then I'm at kilometer 58 at 101, then my speed during that interval was 58 minus 56 over 101 minus 1, or 2 kilometers a minute, I think. That's called a first order forward difference. There are two major problems with that approach. First, it magnifies noise. Here's a data set from my pendulum on the top right here, angle versus time. And on the bottom right, I'm showing you the results of computing the derivative of that data, the first derivative, using first order forward differences. And as you can see, the derivative calculation doesn't look very nice. If we plotted this time series for omega against the measured time series for theta, we get an utter mess. The issue is that the little imperfections in the data get magnified, both by the way a derivative is defined and the way it is calculated in a difference method. If you think about it, noise takes a point and bumps it sideways. And think about what derivatives do to jumps. The derivative of a step function is an impulse. Another major problem. What's to say that your sensor was able to measure the values of a state variable? It's not often that we know what all the state variables of a system are, and it's extremely rare that we can measure all of them. And the act of doing all those measurements might actually change the system dynamics. Often, we don't even know how many dimensions the system has. So how to proceed? With a technique called delay coordinate embedding. I'll explain the mechanics first, and then circle back around to the underlying theory. The basic idea is that you plot the data against delayed versions of itself. So you're working in this new space called reconstruction space, and it has as many axes as you choose. The points in that reconstruction space you build from the data by making a vector of delayed coordinates. Here's a cartoon to show you what I mean. Here I'm using three axes, so I'm embedding in three dimensions, and I've chosen a tau of 0.2. On the left, I've got some data, some measurement x from some dynamical system, measured at 0.1 second intervals. So the first point in reconstruction space is going to have this coordinate on its x-axis, this coordinate on its y-axis, and this coordinate on its z-axis. So here it is. As you can see by my graphics, it can be useful to think about this as the result of running a comb through your data. And the comb has as many teeth as you have chosen axes in your reconstruction space. And the teeth are spread by a time interval that corresponds to the delay that you're choosing for your embedding. There are theoretical and practical constraints on the choice of the number of teeth in the comb, which I'll call m, the embedding dimension, and the spacing of the teeth, tau, the delay. We'll get back to these later in this segment and in more depth later in this unit. To get the next point in the embedded trajectory, we slide the comb down. If you keep doing that, you get a series of points, a trajectory in this new space. Here's an example. Let's say I sample the x-coordinate of that attractor to obtain the time series at the bottom right. 
Then let's say I embed that time series in two dimensions with tau equals 150. I get that thing on the right. Now there's a bunch of underlying theory about the delay and the dimension that you need to do in order to get this to work. In particular, you need to choose m, the dimension, and tau, the delay, properly. Those are the colored words in this slide. If you do that, the reconstructed dynamics are identical in a very specific mathematical way to the full dynamics. We'll come back to these big words in here, this diffeomorphic and topology, in more detail in the next segment. For now, you can think of them as meaning have the same qualitative shape. The words in the bottom right of the slide mean that the sensor that you use to harvest the data has to perform a smooth measurement too. I'll come back to that as well. This machinery is commonly known as the Tockins theorem, but it actually goes back to an earlier paper, a slightly earlier paper, by Packard et al. And it rests on much earlier work by Whitney, Manier, and others. And of course, like most of science, it's been developed further since it was first introduced in the early 80s. I'll give you a detailed bibliography later in this segment. For now, though, let's think a bit more about tau, the delay, and its effects on the reconstructed dynamics. If tau were zero, all of the teeth of the comb would be pointing to the same number, if you think about it. So all of the coordinates of the points would be the same, and all of the trajectory points would be on the main diagonal of the reconstruction space. That's bad, because that means that the dynamics are still squashed flat, which is exactly the effect that we were trying to get rid of with this process. So that's no good. To get this to work, we need the delay coordinate embedding operation to produce something that does not have trajectory crossings. Remember, trajectory crossings are not legal in the kinds of systems that we're studying. So we know that the thing inside the black box didn't have any, and so our reconstruction better not have any either. Here's a series of embeddings with increasing values of tau. You see on the left that the reconstruction starts off near the main diagonal, and then it kind of inflates off of it. At some point, you can kind of see space between all the trajectories. So how does this tie back to those requirements? In theory, if you're working with real numbers, any tau that spreads the comb teeth out even a little bit will effectively remove the crossings because it spreads the trajectories apart. For that reason, the theorems only require that tau is positive. Remember how computer arithmetic works, though. Computers have finite resolution, so two trajectories that are closer than machine epsilon will actually look like they touch from the standpoint of that computer. So while you only need tau greater than zero in theory, in practice, you need a tau that's big enough to spread the comb teeth out far enough that the crossings are gone from the standpoint of the data and the computations that you're using. So as long as your computer can see between these lines, you're OK. But if it can't, you're not OK. You also need to avoid choosing a delay that's a multiple of a period for the obvious reason. If all of your comb teeth happen to hit that one point, then the point in reconstruction space will be on the main diagonal. A side note here, the embedding and the true dynamics can look pretty different. And things can get even wilder when tau gets really big. We'll show you some movies of that later in this unit. What's important is that these objects all have the same basic morphology. Now, our eyes react to geometry, not topology, which is why these objects look different to us. So why is having the same topology useful if they look so darn different? Because many dynamical invariants, like the Lyapunov exponent, are invariant under transformations that preserve topology. And what that means is that you can measure a single quantity from inside a black box, embed it, calculate the Lyapunov exponent, and assert that your result holds for the true dynamics inside the black box, which you couldn't observe. And that's pretty amazing. Taken to an extreme, this implies that I could stick a thermometer outside my office window and use delay coordinate embedding to reconstruct the dynamics of the weather of the Western Hemisphere. Now, why that isn't practical? It goes back to the red-colored words on this slide. To get the topology right, 
you have to use enough axes in the reconstruction space. The original theorems require that m has to be at least twice as many as the number of axes in the original system. In other words, it is sufficient to establish that the reconstruction is a true embedding, that is, it's topologically correct, if you use at least twice as many comb teeth as there are state variables in the original system. Again, though, that's not something you know, and that's a problem. Moreover, that's a very loose condition, overly pessimistic in many cases. In another canonical paper, Tim Sauer and his colleagues established a sufficient condition of m having to be at least twice the capacity dimension of the object. Capacity dimension is that calculation we did with balls of different sizes covering the object. That's a tighter bound, but there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem here because you have to embed the data before you can calculate the capacity dimension. Both of those inequalities are sufficient conditions for embedding to work. In other words, you may be able to get away with fewer dimensions. For example, the Lorentz system is a three-dimensional dynamical system, so d is three. The Takens results would suggest that you need at least seven axes in your reconstruction space to assure that your reconstruction is a true embedding. However, the capacity dimension of the Lorentz attractor is a little over two, and so the Sauer results would suggest that you need at least five axes to get it right. However, it's been shown that you can successfully embed data from the Lorentz system in three dimensions, not five, not seven. Finally, back to that measurement function. It has to be a smooth function of at least one state variable. Note that we actually don't need to know what it's measuring, and that's pretty cool. We just need to be able to justify that the function is smooth, which can still be a challenge sometimes. And the even temporal sampling that's mentioned at the end of that little note is also necessary for the proofs to work. Basically, delay coordinates are kind of like derivatives, if and only if the sampling is even. Okay, so this is powerful machinery, but how to proceed if you don't know anything about the system that you're measuring? You have to estimate good values for m and tau for this to work, and that's where the rubber meets the road in delay coordinate embedding. We're going to talk about that a fair bit later in this unit.